<laughs> All right, guys, um, welcome back. And good evening. I hope that you have all had a great afternoon. It is encouraging to be back with you again tonight. Um, I don't know about you, and I know that we had an announcement this morning regarding the double parking situation. And that from my vantage point in the back, it was packed in here. Um, but that had to be one of the best worship services of singing I've been involved in in a long time. And I hope that you found that as uplifting and encouraging as I did. Now, before we get started, I do know that some of you in this room at least have the potential to be slightly preoccupied as you walk through the doors tonight. There is a game going on that some of you are concerned about. I want you to know that I have not seen anything. I just know it's being played. I'm not going to ruin that for you. And I'm encouraged by the fact that you are here anyway. And I think that I can give you a little insight into what it's going to do for you ultimately. Because I stayed up late into the evening last night, much later than I should have, to watch the team that my rooting interest is associated with ultimately lose on the last play of the game, which is the second time that has happened in the last three contests. So, Miss Vanessa and anyone else in this room that is rooting for the Bucks today, just know that ultimately we can take solace in the fact that that outcome is going to be hevel in the long run. And like I said, it's encouraging to me that so many people are still here making this a priority in their life. We are going to start our dive into the text tonight of chapter one of the book of Ecclesiastes. And before we do that as well, let me mention that I've had a few people ask me if I am sourcing material other than the Bible. I believe the reason it's only a few people is because most of you ultimately know that there is zero chance that I fill 20 some odd class sessions just by using the Bible and my intelligence level alone. So yes, I am sourcing some other material. And if you have any interest in what those things are, it's a couple of books that I'm relying on the most heavily, as well as a few online resources, which include some different videos and podcast series. So if you're interested in finding out what those are, I will be happy to share those with you. Just ask. When I woke up this morning, there was a calendar alert on my watch. And it was telling me to remember that we had fallen back, so to speak, which I knew was coming. But what really caught me off guard, even though it shouldn't because it happened the same way that every calendar day turns, is the fact that I noticed that today was November the 6th. And I was taken back for a moment this morning when I realized that we are less than two months from turning the page on 2022 and bowling straight into 2023 full steam ahead. Does that fact seem to sneak up on anyone else, or is that just me? It's, um, like I said, academically and fundamentally, we know that that happens one day at a time, and that is how it always works. But when I thought about it, it made me think that I really could view the fact that it took me, or caught me off guard, in one of two ways, right? So the first way that I could view that is of saying that we're all familiar with, that time flies when you're having fun, right? Time flies when you're having fun. So while 2022 has certainly had some challenges, um, overall it's been good to me, and I hope it has been good to you, and that is the way in which I believe I'm going to choose to embrace the fact that I was caught off guard by it being November the 6th, because the other common way in which we describe that phenomenon is time really flies by as you get older, right? And I just don't want to come to grips with that reality, at least not yet anyway, even though it seems to be hitting home more and more every day. So as I said, we're going to start in chapter one tonight. We finished our introduction and overview, and I do thank you for 
bearing with me through a two-session intro and overview. I know that at times that can seem laborious, but as we talked about, I believe that it's going to be beneficial to the perspective and understanding the context of the book and some other things that will help us ultimately glean the proper understanding that God would have us to have when we study it. So at this time, let's have a word of prayer, and then we will begin our study of the text. Pray with me, please. Father, we come to you tonight so thankful for all that you do for us. We're, again, thankful to be gathered together here to study your word together. We realize that we are able to come together to study your word in a place that is comfortable to us and that that is a luxury that is not afforded to so many of our brothers and sisters across the world. We ask that you'll help us to not take that for granted as we study your word, in particular the book of Ecclesiastes. We also ask, Father, that you will give us wisdom as we study the words that we will look at tonight, and then give us the courage and fortitude to apply them to our lives so that we will glorify you to the world around us. Father, as always, most importantly, we thank you for Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on our behalf, and we love you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so I know I asked you last week if you would go ahead and read through at least the first chapter of Ecclesiastes. If you couldn't do that, to read the first 11 verses, but do not fear if you did not. We are going to read them together here tonight. I would probably suggest looking directly at your Bible based on the size of the text on the screen. I did not realize that was going to be so small. I apologize. I definitely won't be reading it off that TV. So anyway, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Let's read those words together. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes, and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, and the sun goes down, and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south, and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Okay, so that's Ecclesiastes, the first 11 verses of the first chapter. So let me start by just asking you this simple question. When you look at that passage, particularly in a vacuum, this passage unto itself and the meaning of the words that we see there on the page, is that unsettling to you or is that a positive message to you? Positive? Why so, Arthur? So the fact that there's nothing new under the sun lets us know what to expect, what will be headed our way while we're here on this earth. I can see that. Anything else? So while I agree in part with what Arthur is saying, I will tell you that also when I look at this passage of text, that it is unsettling to me in a few different instances, and these are what those reasons are. One, it is, starts off with this concept of everything being hevel, this word that we've discussed at pretty good length over the past two classes. And then, as Arthur said, it goes into this um, poem, really, of why or how things in nature are cyclical 
and how things remain the same. But then it goes on and it ultimately compares ourselves to those same patterns. And then it tells us that with the fact that there is nothing new under the sun, that things that have been have been forgotten, and the things that are current in this present time will also not be remembered. Now, I do believe that the last thing there I mentioned that we find in verse 11 is what makes it ultimately unsettling to me. I think that that verse 11 is where we see the positive nature of the things are what we can expect to an extent turn a little more ominous. But in this opening passage of Ecclesiastes, we have really the author's foundation of what he's going to lay out before us for the remainder of the book. As we talked about previously, verses 1 through 3, we see this idea of Hevel and everything being Hevel. And then we have the question posed to us that what does man gain at which he toils under the sun? And let me stop here since this is the main theme of the book, and I don't think that I explicitly said this over the last two classes, that this phrase, under the sun, that we see coupled with the concept of Hevel so many times over and over, while I do believe it is referring to our location, our actual presence here on earth, physically being under the sun, I think it also serves as a reminder to say that we are this side of eternity. I think that that is an equally important fact that that phrase is referencing to keep things in the proper perspective. But after these first three verses, which we're told that things are hevel, and then we are posed the question that what do we gain at our time this, uh, from our labor this side of eternity, we get verses 4 through 11, which are going to give us some insight into what the teacher believes the answer to the question posed in verse 3 actually is. And we're going to spend tonight and Wednesday night unpacking all of these different things and working our way through this first section of text in Ecclesiastes. So I want you to think about something with me for the next few minutes. Who in here, just with a slight raise of hand, can recall ever Seeing a child, um, particularly probably a toddler, somewhere between the ages of two and four, I don't know what the exact technical classification of a toddler is, but someone in that age range, entering into a world that they had seemingly conjured up solely in the imagination in their mind, or possibly remember doing that yourself as a kid. And what I, so for a little more clarification on what I mean by that, let me give you an example. As most of you know, I have a two-year-old daughter, Sloan, and a three-year-old daughter, Kava. So I get to see this played out every single day. And for those of you in the room who have kids, you know that when I say every single day, every single day is 100% what I mean. There is no mincing of words there. So when I come home from work, Without fail, I'm greeted in one of three ways. I pull into the driveway, and by the time I open the door to my truck, both girls are there to greet me and welcome me home. Sometimes I guess they're a little more preoccupied, and I don't get that same greeting until I open the front door. But undoubtedly, 90% of the time, one of those two things is coming. And just as an aside here, if you do not yet have children of your own or have never had children of your own, that is one of the small joys that makes parenting 100% worth it. What a gift that is to see someone come up to you with complete, unadulterated joy and exuberance just, just because you've stepped foot back in the same vicinity as them. And then the third way in which I get greeted is sometimes I get home and I open the truck door and they're not there and I go into the house, and they're not waiting there for me. And as it turns out, I am smack dab 
in the middle of a game of hide-and-go-seek in which I am the seeker that I did not even know that I was participating in. But either way, when one of those three things has happened, my oldest, Kava, without fail, poses two questions to me. The first question she always asks is, Dad, are you going to get cozy? Because she knows that there is zero chance that I'm going through the remainder of my four to five hours with them that day, whatever it may hold, wearing jeans and a button-up. Not going to happen. So I go change clothes. I get into what she refers to as my cozy clothes. And as soon as I come back, she says, Dad, do you want to play? And I think most of you in here know that unless something is extremely pressing, the answer to that question is yes. Of course, baby, I would love to play. So then we go down this rabbit hole. We usually start off and we play family, and this is Kava and myself and Sloan, and Savannah's usually excluded because she's had a long day with them already. And to those of you who have ever been a stay-at-home parent, let me tell you that I don't know how you do it. Um, I am extremely impressed, and I'm glad that I get to partake in this to at least give Savannah a little break every day when I get home. So we play family. What that entails is Kava saying, okay, I'm the mom. Then she tells me, Ryan, or dad, she doesn't call me Ryan, just in case you're wondering. She says, dad, you're the baby. Sloan, you're the baby. And so that's what we do. She will have us play games. She will have us go down for a nap. She'll come back in and tell us to be quiet, or I'm going to come back in here, and it's, you're going to have to go to timeout. Then she'll actually put us in timeout. And it's all a game we're playing in which she is in control. And then immediately, as soon as we're done playing family, once ever, whenever her mind has exasperated all the possibilities that we can play in that part of our day, she says, okay, Dad, go get in the car. Now that means go sit on one of our two couches. And when I sit down on the couch, the little one, Sloan, comes and sits beside me, Kava comes over and pretends to buckle us into our car seats. She sits down between us. She puts her hand out, and she starts driving. And if you try to drive as well, she will tell you that that is not safe. So now we're on a trip. We're either going to see Savannah's parents in Ocala or my parents in Alabama or any number of friends that she has been to their house before. And then as soon as that trip is over, we get to where we're going. She says, okay, we're home. Then she tells me to lay down on the doctor's table. Now that's the same couch. That's the car that I was just in, right? So I lay down on the couch and I'm at the doctor's table or I'm in the hospital. And usually, thankfully, it's just a minor cut that I have to get treated and I get a Band-Aid and I'm on my way. Occasionally it's more serious and I have an upset stomach so she needs to give me some medicine. I have had my foot amputated multiple times. And most impressively, she has done a full-on head transplant. So if you ever think you were in need of one of those, I have just the person for you. But that list goes on and on, right? We may go to the zoo. She may be a teacher. Whatever the case may be, she has conjured all of these things up using her imagination. These things are taking place in a world of make-believe that she is the creator of. Now, sadly, at some point, I know that probably one at a time with these things, and some of these things have probably already started to take place, she's going to get a cruel dose of reality. There is going to be some reality checks involved with these different things in her life. Things aren't always as easily dealt with in real life as we all know. The apologies are harder to give and to receive. The unlimited purchasing power to do all of these things doesn't always exist the trip to the doctor that has the news that you need a head transplant or anything else that's not good news doesn't always end with the call to dinner, right? At some point, these things become real for us in our lives. And while we all know that those things that she was doing are just an innocent and expression and a way for her to develop and grow up that sometimes... These things are a learned behavior that if we're not careful, we can take into our adulthood and apply to other portions of our life. I believe 
without even realizing it. And I think that we're going to see that the author of Ecclesiastes warns us against these things. For instance, has anyone in here ever had, we'll even just say, a three-month span where everything that you planned for or everything that you hoped for came to fruition without any technicalities, any issues at all? Obviously, the answer to that question is going to be no. And I think we could probably reduce that down to a month or to two weeks or to a week, and we would still have the answer of no. But sometimes we make things out to be what they actually are not. And Ecclesiastes, particularly this opening passage of Ecclesiastes, is going to be a reality check given to us that will implode our ideas of what things are or should be and tell us what they truly are. And as we've discussed, it does this right from the jump with this stark and almost shock and awe type of text. And I think this is an effective way that the author of Ecclesiastes used to open his book, simply because whether you come to it reading it as someone who already believes in God, whether you come to it as someone who already thinks that they do not believe in God, or whether you're in the middle of those two things, at the very least, the way this text starts is going to get your intention and then more readily invite you to study the rest of what the author has to say. Yeah, Don. Yeah, thank you, Don. And as we're going to see, as you mentioned, that there are things that are worthwhile, and we're going to talk about those, and we're going to talk about those in the context of these first 11 verses as well. But first I want us to look at the context, because we know that the title of the class is Beyond the Hevel, and we spent a fairly extensive amount of time over the first two class periods discussing what Hevel is. So I would like for us to take a little bit of time tonight to look at the context in which this term is being used in the opening of this book. The context of Hevel here seems to be pointing to how fast our lives can go by. Very similar to the conversation we had a little while ago about the fact that it's already November 6th, that things can come and go in an instant. And I think that the author is confirming this very thing with the use of Hevel in this context at least appears to me to in part be referring to the fleeting nature of life. And we can see this idea throughout other places in the Bible that, well, I think that's important is for us to realize that these very thoughts and concepts are being affirmed in other places through the biblical text. So this is not going to be on the screen, but I'm going to turn to it. In the 39th Psalm, the 39th Psalm, we're going to read verses 5 and 6, and then jump to verse 11 as well. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely, all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely, a man goes about as a shadow. Surely, for nothing, they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. And then jumping down to verse 11, when you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. I think that we can see how that is pointing to the fleeting nature of this life. And we can have that reaffirmed again in the 144th Psalm. 
In the 144th Psalm, starting in verse 3, we're going to look at verse 3 and 4. O Lord, what is man that you regard him, or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. I think what we can see through these verses, as well as the text that we read in Ecclesiastes, and what we're going to continue to see in Ecclesiastes, is when it comes to life, it's almost as if we look at it and think, well, there it goes. That's how quick it goes by. That we are born, we live, we die, and it all happens so quickly. And I think that that's the point that is coming across here. And while this can speak to our entire life, our entire existence, I also think that this can speak to individual parts of our life or characteristics of our life or periods in our life. For instance, in Proverbs, the 31st chapter, I believe, verse 30, we're told that charming, or charm is deceitful and beauty is fleeting. It's here and then it's gone. Now, I don't know how much you knew about Joan Collins, but I will tell you that I, without question, know that I subscribe to a different theology than Joan Collins did, but some things are just that apparent. Joan Collins summed up a very similar thought. She said, the problem with beauty is that you were born rich and become poor. You have it, and then you don't. At least in part, I believe the book of Ecclesiastes is a thesis on the manner in which our life is but a vapor. We are here for a minute and then gone forever the next. And I think that we can see that reiterated in the book of James, in the fourth chapter. You don't have to turn there. I will read it for you. But in James chapter 4, I'm going to read starting in verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet, you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears a little time and then vanishes. And if we stopped right there, I think we could agree upon the fact that James is pointing out that our life is fleeting, just as we saw in the two different Psalms that we looked at and in Ecclesiastes. But what's interesting, and will lead us into the next portion of our discussion tonight, is that he's also going to talk about that not only is your life here and then gone, but ultimately we're not the ones that are in control of our life. That control of our life will elude us. Let me read the last portion of what I read and then I'm going to continue. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So I think it's important to note that not only in this text can we affirm the fact that our life is fleeting, we can also see, as we're going to talk about that Ecclesiastes is referring to as well, that our life will be elusive and be uncontrollable. But I believe that this also points to the fact that everything is not meaningless. That's not the way that this phrase is being used through Ecclesiastes. I think we can see that in Ecclesiastes itself in multiple places. One of those places would be in chapter 4, where um, I think it's in verse 6. We're going to talk about it in a couple weeks, so I'm not going to turn to it now. But we see that one thing is clearly better than another. But as we see in James, it's keeping all those things and what they mean to us in the proper perspective. Before we go on to these, uh, this elusive nature, is there anybody that would like to say anything about Hevel here and how it is referencing that our fact is our, the fact that our life is fleeting? Yeah, Guthrie.
Yeah, that's very well said, Matt, and I agree. And I think it's the, the part that I really like about what you said is the fact that it is, it can seem, like I mentioned earlier, that it just flew by. But sometimes when we're in the moment and we're making plans, so to speak, for the future, we act as if we have an infinite amount of time. And we're going to talk about that more on Wednesday night for sure. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, Guthrie, go ahead. I think it's interesting sometimes or often you hear from young high school graduates or those that go off to college, I don't know what I want to do, but I want to make a difference. And yeah. to contrast that here, that's, uh, you know, it could be a very frustrating thing as a, a direction for a young person. Often, later in life, when you're a young person in their career, they'll even express a frustration. I don't feel like I'm making a difference. Yeah. And that may be in part why you got the response that you did. Right. There's <laughs> many young people in this crowd. But yeah, that's often the frustration of life, that at a certain point you realize that you can't. That's expressed here. Right. So in case you couldn't hear, since Guthrie is sitting close to the front, he was talking about the fact that oftentimes in life people set out to want to make a difference. And that's one of the things that they strive to do. However, we ultimately find that sometimes that's not obtainable, which is told to us here at the end of this passage. And that is a stark reality that a lot of times that we don't like to come to grips with. Even in graduation ceremonies, you'll hear, well, I hope your generation makes a difference. Yeah, and... Right? And I think we're going we're gonna to see exactly what you're saying play out through the text. And one of the things that Ecclesiastes is going to teach us how to do ultimately is how to live, right? And, but it's putting things like that, the fact that we're not going to have some lasting impact over the millennia to be remembered by. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, we're, we'll get more to that, but it is a very interesting phenomenon, right? The fact that in verses 4 through 10, there's this poem that describes the cyclical nature of life and how it's the sea is never full and the sun rises and it sets and then it rises immediately back to where it was. And then it's compared to us, as you said, we're never full of hearing or seeing or speaking. And as Guthrie said, that's a well-known fact that the... Um, marketing world plays on. And it's something that being usually what they're trying to get us to do, not that any of their products necessarily are wrong in and of themselves, but how they're appealing to us sort of reaffirms in my mind exactly what we're going to read here. So not only is life fleeting or vanishing in an instant, but it is elusive as well. So I would like for us to just take a minute to consider probably the most common imagery or visual aid that has been discussed in my life when I've studied Ecclesiastes with someone else um, leading the discussion. And while it's common to us, I believe it does serve its purpose. So the concept of this life being elusive, and we can imagine, if you will, that you're at a countertop and someone has a candle in front of you and the candle is lit, and then someone comes by and blows the candle out, and up rises this little puff of smoke. And for whatever reason, um, this is the part of the analogy that always kind of threw me, but I'm going to use it anyway. You decide that you want to get a handful of that smoke and stick it in your pocket and take it home. Why you want to do that, I'm not sure, but the fact is that it doesn't matter because you're not going to be able to do that. You attempt to grab a handful, yet it slips through your fingers. Now, the fact that you can't do that, does that imply that the smoke that you're trying to grab is any less real or maybe an illusion? No. The smoke is there. It's not an illusion. It's real. And we know that. 
and it can't be grasped. And probably what's even more frustrating if you actually try to grab some smoke is that when you do make the attempt, it seems to make the smoke disappear even faster. That when you try to grab a hold of the smoke, it drives it further and further away. The author is pointing to the fact, in my opinion, that life will slip past our attempts for lasting significance and for control of our life and things on this earth. When we try to obtain that control, we will be sadly disappointed, just like the smoke from the candle. Ultimately, there's a chance that we come up empty-handed. To a degree, I believe that we understand through observation how the world works at large, and we're told in Ecclesiastes, these first few verses, how parts of the world work at large, and we understand that we don't understand, right? We understand that we don't know how the sea has never reached its capacity. But then we look into more specific portions of our life, and then fall back into this illusion of thinking that we do have control over some things. But we ultimately can find out that these things don't always go as we planned. And as we read in James chapter 4, please don't misunderstand me into saying that I don't think we should plan for things or we should hope and dream for things. I think that we will see played throughout that that is a good thing to do. That Being wise is better than being foolish. But that doesn't affect, uh, does not affect the fact, affect the fact, I should probably rephrase that. But that does not change the fact that sometimes the things that we think we can control still end up, no matter what we do, falling short in our lives. For instance, imagine someone who is in their late 30s or early 40s, and he or her has spent their life since early adulthood, pursuing a successful career in whatever field it is that they choose. And they have done everything necessary to do that. They've gone to school for it. They have spent their free time learning more about that craft or that trade or their field. They have neglected things that could have been fun in their life to ultimately enhance their career they have done tasks that others chose not to do. And not out of a sense of greed or a love of money or anything along those lines, but simply because they have a desire to provide for themselves and for their family and possibly more of those around them. So they've done all of these things and things are going well. They've achieved the position that they were yearning to achieve. And then they get an email saying there's going to be a mass conference call this coming Monday. And when they join that conference call, they find out that their company has been bought by another larger company. And without any true analysis of what each individual current team member brings to the table, there are sweeping cuts made across the board, and that job is no longer theirs. Or you have someone who is living their life and is healthy of a manner as possible. They eat a balanced diet. They regularly partake in a workout regimen that seems to be working. They don't put things into their body that will do their body harm. And yet they go to the doctor and they get the test results. And not only is it a grim diagnosis, but it's also a grim prognosis. Or the spouse who has been married for 25 years and has a family. And for those 25 years, everything that they have done, they have based around the fact that their spouse is in their life or their children are in their life. Every decision they've made has been woven in the fabric of what their life has become as a family. And then their spouse comes home and says, I'm sorry, but I'm leaving. And there's nothing you can do about it. These things, sadly, we know are part of our reality. We've all seen stories like this play out in our world around us. And I think what Ecclesiastes is showing us, 
And then what we can also see in Psalm 103, verse 15 and 16, is even when we think that we have the proper understanding, even when we think that we have control by doing things that are right and just, at times work, life is just not going to work out the way that we expect it. So Psalm 103, verses 15 and 16, as for a man, his days are like grass. He flourishes. So he's flourishing, right? The successful career, the happy family, the healthy life, like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And that's exactly what the book of Ecclesiastes, I believe, in this opening section is getting at when it says that our life is elusive. Our life is hevel. We often think we are in control and have a grasp on our life and the world around us. But the opening of this book is our version of the reality check that we mentioned earlier that my three-year-old is going to have come in small doses. Yeah, Nathan. Yeah, so first of all, I know everybody can probably hear Nathan, especially since he's sitting in the back row. Yeah, louder for those in the back next time, Nathan, even though that's where you are. Um, no, I agree, and that's exactly what we're going to see that the book of Ecclesiastes ultimately does. The book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to get into that on Wednesday night as we read the, or study more in depth the remainder of portion of these 11 verses, but the book of Ecclesiastes is essentially teaching us what it is to live while fearing God, and the beauty that that actually is going to produce for us. So I know I heard the bell ring, so just know that this is what we're going to talk about on Wednesday night. Wednesday night, we're going to look at the repetitive nature of verses 4 through 10, or 4 through 9, and exactly what that means to us in our life. Then we're going to look at how this makes us confront our own mortality, and then we're going to look and how that ultimately gives us the foundation to live that life well lived, to live the life that Nathan is referring to. So thank you again for being here tonight, and I will see you on Wednesday.
this evening. We'll sing two songs this evening before we are dismissed. First one will be, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. So good to see everybody this Sunday afternoon. Hope you have profited from your Bible class tonight and enjoyed being a part of that. And glad we can be together and just enjoy our fellowship together for a bit tonight as well. I want to mention a couple of things to you before we go this evening. I have a card to read to you from Guthrie and Shannon Nelson. It says, to our dear Temple Terrace family, thank you so much for all the text, cards, plants, and flowers, and sweet words since the passing of my mom. We are blessed to have such a wonderful church family who love my parents while they attended here and continue to encourage them and us in their latter years. Thank you again. And him, Guthrie and Shannon Nelson. We're glad that Guthrie and Shannon are safely back and certainly, certainly have wonderful and fond memories that will endure of Shannon's mom and dad. They were wonderful, wonderful people, and we were, in fact, blessed to have them with us for a good bit. A couple of other things just to mention to you tonight by way of a reminder or two. You know, we've had other members of our church family who have had loss in the last week. Rich Leggett's brother passed away up in Canada. Rich is there and being with his family. We're thankful that he can be there. Mary Williams' stepfather passed away, and his memorial service was yesterday. At the other end of that, we're very thankful for the fact that uh, Dale and Paula had very successful surgeries this week. And we pray for them and their recuperation, that all that will go well. And also little Hunter Sullins, glad that everything went well for him, too, this week. I want to remind you of a matter that we mentioned just in an email briefly this week, and that's about Mandy Allen's sister. She's been diagnosed with brain cancer. And on Tuesday, she'll have some tests that will clarify both the diagnosis and the prognosis. And we certainly want to pray that that will be the best outcome possible. We, um, we announced over the past several weeks leading up to last Sunday <clears throat> that last Sunday is the annual special contribution that we have to help with a variety of things that are physical in nature around our building and with indebtedness on our building. And was mentioned um, in the family reporter and email, uh, you all generously gave over $47,000 last Sunday. You always give so generously on that week. 
and we appreciate that so very, very much. You help us with that, and we appreciate that. Remind you of the high school Devo tonight, the Monday night college class tomorrow night. So many good things happening, so many good opportunities. Let me just leave you this, with this as we leave tonight. This is from Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever. What a great thought for us to begin a new week. Let's stand. We'll sing the song. We'll be dismissed. We sang this one back at the singing night a couple months ago. I led it for the first time. I really enjoyed leading it and getting to know the song. Fell in love with the, the thought behind it. It's not going to work. All right, so we'll just be led in a closing prayer at this time. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity that we have been given to gather together as a church family and study your word. We thank you for this week that is before us. We ask that you help us to be good stewards of the time and blessings that we have been given. Be with us this week. Keep us safe. Help us to shine your light in this dark world. Forgive us when we fall short. We thank you especially for your son and his sacrifice on the cross. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.